بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا وأرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to this session of prophetic parables where we are going through the various parables mentioned by our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so far we have covered the parables uh, that have been found in Bukhari and Muslim agreed upon by both and today we have two parables also uh, narrated and uh, found in Bukhari and Muslim the first of these parables is concerning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he was the last of all prophets. And so this hadith is narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal Inna mathali wa mathal al-anbiya'i min qabli kamathali rajulin bana baytan fa'ahsanahu wa ajmalahu illa mawdi'a labinatin min zawiyah فجعل الناس يطوفون به ويعجبون له ويقولون هل وضعت هذه اللبنة فقال يعني النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأنا اللبنة وأنا خاتم النبيين In this hadith the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says Indeed my example in comparison to the other prophets before me is that of a man who builds a house very nicely and very beautifully except for one place of one brick in a corner so the people they go about in this house and they wonder at its beauty but then they say, if only this brick is put in its place. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, so I am that brick and I am the last of the Prophets. And I am the last of the Prophets. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam ﷺ, He created him with the fitrah the natural disposition, the natural recognition to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to recognize His oneness and His sole right to be worshipped alone without any partner. And then when Adam alayhi salam was sent down to the earth, he had with him this message of tawheed and iman and he passed it on to his children. And then they pass it on to their successive generations, one after the other. But then, over time, shaitan managed to lead them astray. And so, he started to lead them astray one generation at a time. Until, finally, the message of Tawheed became lost and... People started associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so shirk became prevalent. So it was because of this, it was because of this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then started sending the prophets and the messengers one after the other with the task of bringing people back to the fitrah, to the fitrah of their father Adam alayhi salam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how everyone 
was upon Tawheed in the beginning, and then they divided. They went astray. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, كَانَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ النَّبِيِّينَ مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ وَأَنزَلَ مَعْهُمُ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ فِي مَخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ that mankind had once been together, united, one community, upon Tawheed. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised prophets as deliverers of good news for the believers and warners for the disbelievers. And Allah revealed the scriptures uh, in truth to judge among people regarding what they differed in. <clears throat> and so... The mission of all the prophets and messengers from the beginning of time was one and the same. And that was to basically call the people back to the worship of Allah alone, without any partner. And so when it came to the foundations of the deen, you know, Tawheed, belief in Allah, belief in the resurrection after death, these things, their message was one and the same. There was no difference between them in terms of delivering that message. But when it came to the laws, the legislations, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what rituals uh, and what deeds and what you know laws in terms of halal and haram, uh, which you know laws do we worship Allah through? These set of laws and legislations that is where they differed, and so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent each prophet and messenger a different set of laws, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "لِكُلٍّ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجَةً." To each of you we have ordained a code of law and a way of life. And so the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided for Ibrahim alayhi salam to preach to his people were different than the laws sent to Musa alayhi salam to teach Bani Israel. And the laws and the sharia of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also different. And describing this, the Prophet wasallam said in a hadith narrated uh, by Bukhari, he said, I am the nearest of all the people to Isa alayhi salam, both in this dunya and in the next. And then he said, the Prophets are paternal brothers, meaning they have one father. They are paternal brothers but their mothers are different. But their religion is one. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. So the message of Tawheed and Iman was the same. Just like brothers who have one father. And as for the details of the laws and the legislations, that is what is different, which is like the different mothers of of these brothers. So they have one father, but they have different mothers. So the point is that the religion that all of these prophets and messengers brought from Allah was one religion, and that is the religion of Islam, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, Surah Ali Imran, Inna deena inda Allah al Islam, that the religion in the sight of Allah is nothing but Islam, meaning from the beginning of time, meaning from the beginning of time until Yawm Al-Qiyamah, there is only one religion in the sight of Allah that is accepted by Allah, and that is Islam. And then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, after sending these prophets and messengers over time, throughout the centuries, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala decided to finally conclude this chain of prophets and messengers by sending the last of them 
and he was none other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And so this was Allah's final message to us human beings. After his death, there would be no more revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mankind. Or at least not any new, not any new information or not any new revelation in terms of what we should believe, what we should not believe, in terms of how we should worship Allah and how we should not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The religion became completed with the sending of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent, he was sent with a message to reconfirm the eternal message that has been coming from Adam alayhi salam and he was sent with this message that basically sums up everything that you know was contained in those previous messages but making his message the Quran and his revelation to supersede all the previous scriptures that's it this is the Quran now and it will supersede all the previous scriptures and we human beings have to follow this and nothing else and and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-ma'idah wa anzalna ilayka al-kitab bil-haqqi musaddiqan lima bayna yadayhi min al-kitab wa muhaymanan alayh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we have revealed to you this book with the truth as a confirmation of the previous scriptures and a supreme authority over them. So the Quran confirmed everything that was mentioned in the previous scriptures in terms of the message of Tawheed, in terms of Iman, believing in Allah, believing in the resurrection, etc. And the Quran became the supreme authority, basically superseding everything else and canceling everything else. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, coming back to our parable, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us a parable showing us how this message that he was sent with completed the eternal message of Islam and how he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam represents the last of all the Prophets sealing sealing prophethood with that and so he did this by comparing the prophets and the messengers that Allah sent to the bricks of a house and so the builder who built this house he took great care in building this house making sure that it was built perfectly and it looks beautiful and perfect but he left out one slot in a corner of that house. So when people came to check out this house, they admired its beauty and its perfection. But then they noticed that slot, that empty uh, slot in the corner. And so they said, if only this space was filled, then this house would have become perfect, completely perfect. And so this is when the Prophet ﷺ says, I am that brick that is supposed to go into that empty slot, and I am the last of the Prophets. I am the last of the Prophets. So when this last brick was filled, the house was finally completed. And thus, by Allah sending his last Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to mankind, the message of Allah to us human beings became complete, became complete and finished. And what this means, it means several things. This means several things. First and foremost, it means that this message is for all of mankind. This message is for all of mankind. As opposed to the prophets and messengers that were sent in the past, 
they were sent specifically to their people and not to all of mankind. But with the coming of the Prophet وسلم, and filling that last brick, that's it. There will be no more prophets and messengers after this. Therefore, logically, it's obvious that he وسلم, has been sent for all of mankind until the Day of Judgment. Secondly, this means that this message is for all times and all places. This message that Allah has sent, the last and final message, it is for all times and all places. Unlike the previous messages that were for a specific time and a specific place. Thirdly, this message is complete with nothing, absolutely nothing left out from it that we need, that we human beings need for our dunya and our akhirah. Nothing has been left out. And so there is nothing that we human beings need for our dunya or for our akhirah except that it has been mentioned in this message because this is the last brick in the house. That's it. There's not going to be any message after that. Which means that this message will be eternal. And it will last until the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, providing us human beings with what we need. With what we need. And finally, what this means is that there will be no messenger. There will be no prophet, nor any messenger, or any new message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this. Because that's it. The final brick has been put in its place. And there's no room for anything else. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ that Muhammad is not the father of any your men, any of your men, but rather he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. So just like the house whose final brick is put in that empty slot, uh, and there are no more empty slots in this house, right? The people, the Prophet ﷺ said the people came in, and they saw a beautiful house, but they noticed one empty space. Just one. Not two or three, no, just one. So just like that house who, you know, that had that empty slot, now the brick has been put there. There are no more other empty slots. Likewise, with the coming of the Prophet wasallam and him passing away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his final message and now there remains no more empty spaces, no more empty slots for any other prophet or messenger to come after him. Which means that whoever claims, whoever claims to be a prophet or a messenger from Allah, or that he receives revelation from Allah after the death of the Prophet wasallam, then there is no doubt that he is a liar. There is no doubt that he is a liar. Ibn Kathir, uh, he says uh, in his commentary of this uh, verse in Surah Al-Ahzab, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَاكِرْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِينَ He says, Allah has told us in his book and his messenger has told us in the Mutawatir Sunnah that there will be no more prophets after him so that it may be known that everyone who claims this status after him, that he is a liar and a fabricator who is misguided and he is misguiding others. And so among the lessons that we learn from this parable is first and foremost that the prophets and the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were all like brothers who were selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the same message to mankind. 
what they brought from Allah, the message, the underlining, the under, under underlining message, the foundation of their message was the Tawheed of Allah, warning against shirk, and teaching us about who Allah is and what Allah wants from us and where we are going after after death. Secondly, uh, the second lesson that we learn from this parable is that the best of the prophets, the best of all the prophets and messengers, was none other than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he was that last brick to be put in that in that house of prophethood, and without it, it would have been incomplete. And also the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam speaking about himself, he said that "Ana sayyidu waladi Adam wala fakhr." He said that I am the master or the leader of the sons of Adam, but I say this without boasting. I say this without boasting. And so the Prophet وسلم, was the last of all the prophets and the best of them. The third lesson that we learn from this parable is that through, through the coming of the Prophet وسلم, through Allah sending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah uh, sent His final message for all human beings until the last day. So, no one has any excuse after this. No one has any excuse after this. With Allah sending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for all of mankind, after this, no one has any excuse to come before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment and say, Oh Allah, you did not send any message. You did not send any messenger to inform us of this day. And so the hujjah and the proof has been established by Allah sending Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this proof has been established upon us human beings until the last day. Uh, unlike, unlike the case with the previous prophets and messengers who were only sent to uh, their people specifically, and there could have been other people uh, who did not receive a message at that time. Or like between the coming of the prophets, like for example, uh, between Isa alayhi salam and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there were no there were no prophets and messengers, and that is a period of approximately uh, five hundred years, right? Five hundred to six hundred years. So during that period, the people who lived in that period, they perhaps have an excuse. They would have an excuse to say, "Oh Allah, the message." that you sent with the last prophet Isa alayhi salam it became lost and the people became christians and they changed his religion and we were lost we didn't have any any guide from you subhanahu wa ta'ala so they will be excused but once allah sent prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that's it that that excuse no longer exists finally uh among the lessons that we learn from this parable a very very important lesson and that is to believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the seal of the Prophets this is from the foundations of our Iman this is from the foundations of our Iman and so a person cannot be a believer without acknowledging and believing that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the last of all prophets and messengers and that there will be no more prophet and messenger after him. Whoever believes that it is possible for another prophet and messenger to come or he says that there is another prophet, another messenger after him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then such a person 
is not a believer, he is a kafir. Whoever believes that there is a prophet or messenger after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he is not a believer. And so that goes for uh, the various sects that appeared uh, throughout our Islamic history where people associated themselves with Islam, but they said we have another prophet, like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and the Qadianis, or like the Nation of Islam, claiming that Elijah Muhammad, that he is a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We move on after that to our next parable today, and that is the parable in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described the feelings and the sentiments that the believers are supposed to have for one another. And so this hadith uh, is agreed upon, mentioned by both Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, the narrator is an numan ibn Bashir radiyallahu an. Qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Mathalu al-mu'minina fi tawaddihim wa tarahumihim wa ta'atufihim Mathalu al-jasadi idha ishtaka minhu udwun Tada'a lahu sa'iru al-jasadi bis-sahari wal-humma In this hadith the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The example of the believers with regards to their mutual love, their compassion, their sympathy, is like that of one body. When any part of it feels pain, the rest of the body responds with sleeplessness and fever. And so, the relationship between the members of this ummah is unlike any other relationship of any other group of people. The members of this ummah, the believers, are bonded by one thing, and that is their iman, and nothing else. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the believers, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ that the believers, men and women, are awliya. They are awliya for one another. And awliya are basically uh, allies, friends, helpers, supporters, protectors. This is the meaning of awliya. And Imam al Commenting on this verse, he says, meaning that their hearts are united in mutual love, affection, and sympathy because of what unites them, of their deen and their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ashinqiti, Muhammad al Amin Ashinqiti, uh, the famous uh, Sheikh who passed away uh, in the last century and he was a professor uh, in Medina he was uh, one of the scholars of Medina he used to teach in Al-Masjid al-Nabawi and he has a very famous tafsir Adwa al-Bayan he mentions a very beautiful observation of how in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions us, the believers, by saying, by addressing us and saying, Anfusukum, yourselves. But meaning, not meaning us, you know, when, when you say, for example, uh, take care of yourself. If somebody was to tell you, take care of yourself. Uh, or if somebody was to address uh, a group of people and he said take care of yourselves what do you understand from that you understand from that that each person should take care of his own self but in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses us and says Anfusukum, yourselves Ash-Shinqiti 
Sheikh al Shanqiti, he, he mentions that what is actually meant in the context of believers is your brothers and sisters. And so he says, this indicates how the bond of Islam makes the Muslim, the, the Muslim's brother, your Muslim brother, it makes him like you, like yourself. It makes him like yourself. And then he gives examples. He says, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا, ولا تُخْرِجُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ And do not expel yourselves from your homes. He says what is meant here is do not expel your Muslim brothers from their homes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the story of the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha in Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا That when you heard this slander, the believers and the men and the women of the believers, they thought of themselves, they thought good of themselves. He says what it means is not themselves, but of their brothers and their sisters. They, taught, they thought good of their brothers and their sisters. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hujurat, وَلَا تَلْمِيزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ do not, uh, do not make fun of one another, of yourselves. وَلَا تُلْمِزُوا, ولا تلمزوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not uh, call yourselves with evil names. What is meant is, what is actually meant is, do not call your Muslim brothers and sisters by evil names. Do not make fun of them. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا, ولا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِلِ let not one of you to consume, let not, do not consume your, do not consume your wealth unjustly. Do not consume your wealth unjustly. What is meant is do not consume the wealth of your brother unjustly. And then he mentioned the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. So all of this shows us, all of this shows us how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to, uh, you know, get this message across to us that we are like one. We are like one. The believers are like one. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam expounded on that in this hadith. In this parable that he gave. So in this parable, the Prophet ﷺ described this bond between the believers by comparing them to the human body. When a part of your body starts to feel pain, what happens? Because all of the parts of the body are connected with one another, your body Every part is connected with the other. No part is independent. No part of your body is functioning independently on its own. Each part, each organ, each limb is connected with another. And so this is the human body. So because each part is connected directly to the other, what happens when one part feels pain? or falls ill, the entire body feels the pain. And so when you fall sick, when you fall ill, if you have an infection in your lungs, it is not only your lung that will feel the pain or that will suffer, but now your entire body will, will not be able to sleep. Your entire body will, you know, you're going to get a fever now. Your entire body is going to feel it. You're going to shiver. Your entire body is going to shiver. You're not going to be able to eat properly. You're not going to be able to sleep properly. And so on and so forth. And so, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that this is how the believers are.
If one part of the body feels pain, then the entire body responds. And so likewise, likewise, the believers, if one group of us, if one group of us suffers, no matter what part of the earth they're in, if we hear of their suffering, then that suffering will be felt by the rest of us. Because we are connected, just like that one body. And what connects us? What connects us is nothing but our Iman and our Islam. But now here's the important part. Not just the feeling of the pain, that's what the Prophet ﷺ described, but now the more important part is that just like the body that falls ill, it puts up its defenses and it fights back the illness. The entire body responds by fighting back. Likewise, the believers. We don't only feel the pain and the suffering, but now we respond by, we, we respond with action, by coming to the aid of our brothers and sisters, coming to their defense. And so it's not just a false feeling of pain, but rather the kind of feeling that, that pushes us to action, that pushes us to do something about that pain. And so this is what we see in this hadith. This is what the Prophet ﷺ wanted to get across to us. That if you feel the pain, do something about it. Just like that body. When it feels the pain, it responds. And you know the immune system and the entire body will start you know, putting up its defense and fighting back. And this is what we see. This is what we see not only in the words of the Prophet ﷺ, but more importantly, in his action, in what he showed us through his example. And so we see in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, examples of this feeling that he had for the believers, wherever they may have been. And also we see how he taught these meanings to his companions. And so there are so many examples of how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ came to the aid of their brothers and their sisters when they were in need. And the best example of that is the, uh, when the Muhajirun came from Mecca to Medina, leaving behind everything and they had nothing they came and were welcomed by the Ansar who gave them everything that they had. And how the Prophet ﷺ, he partnered up one Muhajir with one of the Ansar, making them brothers. And we see, you know, there are so many examples, too many to mention, of how the Ansar sacrificed what they had for their brothers from the Muhajirun. And so, this is what Islam came to teach us and this is what Islam came to teach us and this is what actually existed 1400 years ago. But unfortunately, the reality that we live in today is the complete opposite of that. And so unfortunately, the Muslims today, not only are we disunited, but we don't feel that pain. And even if we feel it, there's little that we do about it. And so among the lessons that we learn from this parable, there are many. Among them is, first of all, what this hadith teaches us is two things. What this hadith teaches us is two things. The first is that the believer, the true believer, cannot sleep at night in a warm, comfortable bed while knowing that he has brothers and sisters who are suffering out in the cold. He cannot eat properly a delicious meal while knowing that there are families, Muslim families out there, whether in his own locality or anywhere in the world, 
when he knows that they have to go to sleep at night hungry. A Muslim does not feel comfortable living in this life when he knows that he has brothers who have been imprisoned unjustly and been thrown into internment camps like our brothers and sisters in eastern Turkestan, the Uyghurs. A Muslim cannot possibly feel comfortable in this life knowing that there are children in Muslim countries, whether it be in Palestine, whether it be in Syria, whether it be in uh, Kashmir, in Burma, who they have be they have become orphans and their mothers have become widows why because of an enemy who basically took away their fathers and their husbands for no other crime than because of their deen and their iman this is the first thing that it teaches us the second thing that this hadith teaches us is that this feeling, this feeling, it moves the believer to take action, like we mentioned. It moves him to take action by doing whatever he can, whatever is at his disposal, to remove that suffering. And so it's not just an internal feeling. You hear about what is happening to your Muslim brothers and sisters, and... You feel sad about it, but then, you know, you go to sleep at night, you don't do anything about it. If you truly feel for them, if you truly feel for them, then you're going to do something about it. And that is the test of Iman. That right there is the test of your Iman. What will you do about it? And that's why here the Prophet ﷺ said that the believers, he did not say the Muslims, he said, Al-Mu'minun, the believers, the people of Iman, are like one body. Why did he refer to them as people of Iman? Because this is a test of your Iman. And so, the believer, when he feels that pain, it makes him to do something about it. To remove that suffering. Either with his wealth, by giving what he can to remove that suffering, or with himself by standing up and defending them or with his uh, personality if he has a certain status if he is the leader of a country or he, he's a personality a famous personality by, by, by standing up for them and basically uh, you know uh, basically raising awareness of these Muslims who are suffering or, even if he is not famous, you know, every single Muslim, every single Muslim has the ability to, you know, support our Muslim brothers and sisters who are suffering through our words, by writing about them, raising awareness about them, uh, campaigning for them, and so on and so forth. And above all, if you can't do anything, you do have one weapon in your hand, and that is the greatest weapon, it is the power of dua and so you could raise your hands in the middle of the night and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve their suffering whoever they be wherever they be as long as they are your brothers and sisters in faith and that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when some of his companions who he had set, sent out on a mission they were attacked and they were viciously killed and they happened to be some of the best of his companions Hufad of the Quran 70 of them when he heard about that he prayed Qunut in every single Salah for an entire month praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against those oppressors making dua against them and so this is the least that we can do to make dua 
against uh, the tyrants and the oppressors and to make dua for our brothers and sisters. The second lesson that we learn from this hadith and this parable is that whoever does not feel the pain and the suffering of his Muslim brothers and sisters, then this is either due to one of two reasons. Either because he is drugged, he is, you know, under drugs, just like a body, a body that, you know, uh, let's say you have to go for surgery, what they do is they they drug a part of your body so that you don't feel the pain. Or if you're going for a heart surgery, they drug your entire body so that you go unconscious. Why? Because they don't want you to feel the pain. So either you are like a body that is drugged and that's why it does not feel the pain, or, and, and you being drugged means uh, that you are drugged by the dunya. And so you have love and attachment for the dunya and your desires. And so this is why you don't feel the pain of your Muslim brothers and sisters. Or the second reason, that you are not a part of this ummah. That you are not a part of the ummah. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that the believers are like one body. So if you don't feel the pain then either you are like the one body that is drugged or you are not a part of the body and that is why you don't feel the pain. Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, commenting on this hadith, he says that is why the believer is delighted by what the believers are delighted with. Whatever makes the believers happy, it also makes him happy. And he is hurt by what hurts them. Whatever hurts the believers, it also hurts him. And, and then he says, whoever is not like that, then it means he is not from them. He is not a part of them. If you don't feel the same feelings as, you know, the believers, then it means you're not one of them. The third uh, lesson that we learn from this hadith is that if the ummah, if the ummah was to stand together, the way this hadith teaches us, we would never hear of the atrocities against Muslims that we hear almost every day. If we were to truly stand together, supporting one another, not only feeling the pain, but doing something about it. Whether it be at the level of the masses of the Muslims, or even their leaders. If all the Muslims, all the believers were to stand united, supporting one another, we would never hear of the enemies of Islam carrying out atrocities against Muslims. Why? Because they would fear us. And Shaykh Ibn Baz, he says in this regard, uh, commenting on the hadith, he says, their resemblance, the re resemblance of the um, uh, uh, he says their resemblance, the resemblance of the believers to one structure and one body, it proves that through their solidarity, through their mutual co cooperation and compassion, they will be united and their ranks will be orderly and they will be safe from their enemies. And it's true. It's true. Whenever this ummah was united and stood together and had each other's back, that is when the enemies of Islam would not dare to do anything to us. But when the enemies of Islam saw that we are disunited and we don't have each other's back, this emboldened them and they said, if we do something, they're not going to do anything about it. They're not going to come to one another's aid. And so that is why we see the atrocities happening wherever they are happening throughout the Muslim world and beyond. The fourth lesson that we learn from this hadith and this parable is uh, that there will come a day, there will come a day when those who 
hear the prolonged suffering of their brothers and sisters and they even may feel the pain but they don't do anything about it and they don't aid them then such people will be made to face something similar to that suffering and then no one will care about them and so we need to be aware of this that if we don't stand up to do something about the suffering of our brothers and sisters then a day will come when we will be in the same situation and then no one will come no one will come to aid us and no one will care about us and this is because this is because uh, prolonged suffering it causes feelings to become lost it causes feelings to become lost when you hear about so much suffering and you don't do anything about it you know you become used to it you become used to hearing about it every day and then it becomes normal and so when it happens to you others will find it to be normal and this also as we said it would it, it basically emboldens the enemies uh, to continue in their aggression finally the last point that we will mention here uh, is that since the believers have been described uh, in this hadith as being, being uh, supportive of one another and uh, as Allah describes them as awliya for one another allies, protectors and so on and so forth and since they are supposed to feel that mutual love, compassion, and sympathy for one another, and how this is a sign of their iman, it means, all of that means that these feelings and these sentiments and this sympathy, these are restricted to them. These feelings that you have are supposed to be restricted for the believers. And it should not be shown to other than the believers. And this is because the Muslims are like one body, as the Prophet ﷺ described. And so, whoever's body is already suffering from pain, is it possible that he would feel the pain of somebody else? Think about it. The Prophet ﷺ described our ummah as being one body, if one part feels pain, the entire body feels pain. So, does it make sense that if this ummah and, you know, if you were to think about it, uh, our ummah is really, uh, really feeling a lot of pain throughout, throughout the, the, the entire body. Every part of it is suffering. And so, the true believer he should be feeling a lot of pain right now. So it doesn't make sense that we should be feeling the pain of other nations, other groups of people. No, of course. You know, that is, you know, simple logic. But this does not mean, I'm not trying to say here, that if you see uh, a person, even if he's not a Muslim, a kafir, you see him on the street, homeless, doesn't have anything to eat. This doesn't mean that you're not going to feel any uh, any compassion towards him. That's not what I'm saying. This is not what I mean. What I mean is in general. In general, uh, Muslims feel for one another. And so when we hear of a certain atrocity happening to Muslims, we should feel that pain. If you do not feel that pain, but rather when you hear of an atrocity happening to others, to other non-Muslims, and then you feel the pain, then it means there's something wrong here. It means that there is a serious problem here. If you don't feel the pain and the suffering 
uh, for the Muslims like you feel it for the non-Muslims, then this is where there is a problem. This is where there is a serious problem. And so, uh, to, to, to put things into perspective, uh, just like you as a human being, you feel pain for your own kind. And this is a sign of your humanity. You see another human being, irrespective of his religion, you see him suffering, you're going to feel some compassion for him, some sympathy for him. And this is a sign of what? Of your humanity and your human nature. Similarly, the believer, if he sees another believer, another Muslim, suffering, and he feels that pain, then it is a sign of what? Not a sign of his humanity, but a sign of his Iman. And so if you don't feel for another human being, then it's a sign of your weak humanity or human nature. If you don't feel for your Muslim brothers and sisters, it's a sign of your weak Iman. It's a sign of your weak Iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make us to be uh, uh, to be one ummah uh, standing up for each other we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us united once again as we were in the past we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, grant us beneficial knowledge that translates into action subhanakallahumma bihamdik أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته